Hey folks, how's it going? Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, recycling phase of the pentose phosphate pathway. And the recycling phase, if you guys remember from the last uh, couple of reactions here, is we took RU5P and we made it into XU5P and R5P. Uh, so we made a ketose and an aldose. Uh, that's an important distinction here um, because only transketolase will only ever react with uh, it'll only ever react with xylulose biphosphate in the forward direction here. Now in the reverse direction it'll react with a multitude of things, but it's always going to react with the ketose. So the ketose is here: fructose six phosphate, xylulose seven phosphate, uh, and or cetoheptulose seven phosphate and xylulose five phosphate are the only things that transketolase will react with. So that's important to keep in mind here. Now, transketolase uh, uses the enzymatic cofactor TPP, which stands for thiamine pyrophosphate. And that is a B vitamin derivative in the active site. So you need B vitamins to make all these cofactors. Uh, I've only drawn the important part of TPP here, which is this aromatic ring. Um, and the rest of it has several other functionalities, but I've drawn this as an RNH3. Uh, because this NH3 here uh, is actually going to do quite a little bit of proton transfer in our reaction. So we're starting here with uh, xylulose 5-phosphate. I'm only going to do this reaction right here uh, in this video, but you guys should be able to use the same mechanism to do the other part, uh, which is the second run of transketolase uh, in the pentose phosphate pathway. So use this mechanism to kind of work this one out. Uh, but the first step here uh, is kind of an interesting one. Note here we have an aromatic ring. It's a thiophene ring. We have a double uh, a lone pair here on sulfur that gives us our 2, 4, 6 pi electrons, which we need for our aromatic ring. This nitrogen uh, has four bonds and contributes the two of the pi electrons uh, through the system. Um, and, of course, this nitrogen being positive is going to be a major driving force in the energetics of this reaction. Uh, it also in contributes favorably to a strange phenomenon we see uh, in TPP, which is called an illid formation. And if you don't remember what an illid is, it's a, it's a system where we have two um, adjacent charges that are essentially stabilizing each other through electrostatics. And so because this nitrogen is positive, we're able to form an illid uh, where we pull off this vanillic, or it looks like a vanillic hydrogen, off of this aromatic ring. And it's going to give a pair back to this carbon here. So we're going to generate a charged vanillic sp2 hybrid orbital uh, that's stabilized through electrostatics uh, with this uh, nitrogen next door. So that makes it uh, kind of helpful that we can do this. It makes it more reactive here at the alpha position uh, and gives us uh, a little bit of act ability to... Uh, to do some chemistry. So that's kind of the big overview here. So the first thing we need to do is generate our TPP illid, which is just pull off this hydrogen. So here I've drawn the TPP illid. Now the negative sign is kind of lost, so I'm going to redraw it over here. We have a lone pair on that carbon and a negative charge. You can see here that the negative and positive are adjacent, and that's stabilizing. That makes this favorable. You actually get a little bit of an electrostatic bonus um, out of having a negative and positive so close. Uh, and then you can see our glutamic acid or our aspartic acid or whatever is that's in the active site here is now protonated, having taken that hydrogen away. So key thing here is that we want to, of course, use this TPP to do an attack. So if you look at here, we have XU5P, which is one of the precursors from the pentose phosphate pathway. Uh, the most reactive position on this for a nucleophilic attack, of course, is at the uh, ketone. So we're going to do an attack from the TPP illid. That's what this thing is called. So we're going to do our attack here at the ketone. And then we need to protonate. So our protonation can happen from a number of places. Now if you look around here at the stuff I've drawn, it can either happen from our old uh, glutamic acid, uh, but it won't. This is only used for making illid making or undoing the illid. 
So our only other choice is really to use the other piece of TPP, the uh, amino part, to protonate. So we're going to grab that off. Chunk. So we have our TPP illid now uh, made into an adduct with xylulose 5-phosphate. And you can see that here, this whole ring is now attached at the old ketone spot. We have a deprotonated amino group here, and we have an OH where the ketone oxygen used to be because it's been reduced to a hydroxyl group. Okay, so key thing about what happens with TPP is that TPP is always used for two carbon transfers in this mechanism. Um, we'll, we'll also see how it's used for alpha decarboxylations later, uh, but those are really what... Um, those are the two uses for TPP. Uh, the reason that this works is because, uh, remember that nitrogen is charged. Uh, getting rid of that charge is a major driving force uh, to stabilize this molecule. So if we were to number down from that nitrogen, alpha, beta, each carbon as we get farther away, it's going to break uh, after a beta. So you essentially break bonds to carbons away from the end. And I call this an electronegative. So we want to be two carbons away from electronegative and that's where we're going to break a new bond. So our choices here are to break the bond here or here. Now I said two carbon transfers. So our only choice for breaking the bond is to break it here and so these two top carbons can be transferred. So how do we do that? Well, it's just similar to what we saw with aldolase and glycolysis where we're going to pull a hydrogen using this histidine. That's going to make a double bond ketone. That carbon-carbon bond is now going to break. Let me just clarify this so you can see it. Carbon-carbon bond is going to break. It's going to go to this bond. And then the nitrogen is going to end up with a pair. That is super crucial. Nitrogen must end up with a pair. And that's going to be the same for both transaldolase, that was the next step in this, for aldolase uh, in glycolysis and for transketolase. They all have to end up giving a nitrogen a pair back. That's the whole thermodynamic driving force behind this whole system. What this all results in is a glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. That's good old GAP. GAP uh, is a glycolytic intermediate, um, and it's perfectly useful for lots of stuff, and we'll use it in the next step. Um, but what you can also see here is our TPP with our two carbons on it. Now, anytime you see this TPP in this state, notice that we've lost our aromaticity in our ring. We need a double bond here. And so this thing can push a resonance form to put charge back at that alpha carbon. So we would end up with something like negative charge here with again our regular looking TPP on this side. That's going to be the resonance forms and that means that this alpha carbon is still super reactive. Now if we were to just protonate here, if we were just to just grab this hydrogen, we would just be stuck with a two carbon uh, piece. And we don't want to do that. This is a transketolase. And a transketolase does transfers two carbon transfers. So we need to put it on something else. We're not satisfied with just breaking it off like we saw with aldolase. Uh, we need to transfer it onto a different carbon uh, substrate. And what we're going to transfer it onto is our ribose 5-phosphate. We're going to put that onto R5P, which was the other, remember, piece uh, from our shuffling reactions on the last step. So here we go. We have our resonance form. We're going to attack here, and we're going to protonate from that histidine, give a charge back here. So now we've just attached it. Now for transketolase, this old ketone always swings to the left side and becomes an OH on the left. That's because the this attack happens predominantly on a single face, and that means that we only get attacks that generate left-handed uh, chiral centers here, or S-chiral centers. So I'm going to finish this in part two.